Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to our ESG and sustainability webinar series. We had a one month uh, rest, but we're back with another three webinars um, on ESG and sustainability. Um, so today uh, we've got two new presenters. Um, I, I think uh, we, we felt you must be sick and tired of Ashley and I by now. Um, so we've invited uh, Brett Spicer, who's a partner in sustainability and Brett is based in Brisbane, but obviously part of our broader national team. So Brett will be sharing some wisdom and insights and practical um, experience with us today. And we've also invited Tim Smith, who's a senior analyst sustainability and he's based in Perth, also part of our BDO Australia national team. So first of all, welcome Brett and morning Brett and uh, the same to Tim, nice to have you here. Thank you. Cheers. Then, um, as I said earlier, um, over the first uh, over six months, I think from around March, every month we had a webinar we, where we talked about activating sustainability at your organisation. We talked through a roadmap. Um, we worked through um, how to do a materiality assessment, how to do a material um, maturity analysis. We talked about putting it all together in a sustainability report. We considered the frameworks and we even talked about assurance and do you want to get some form of assurance over your sustainability report? And obviously, this is a continuous improvement process. So once you've got that baseline sustainability report, what strategies do you need to improve um, and take the next step on your sustainability journey? Now, uh, we've launched three more uh, webinars. Uh, today, we're looking at Decarbonisation 101. Now, Brett, I think you came up with the title and I haven't asked you where the 101 came from, but this morning as I was driving to the office, I thought that reminds me of a first year university subject. Because when I studied in South Africa, if you start with accounting, it's accounting 101. And then the second semester is accounting 102. And then in your second year, it's accounting 201, something like that. Is that where you got the, the name from? That was the general concept behind it, that we hear a lot of discussion um, around decarbonisation, climate change and all these sort of things. But there's sometimes there's some, some foundational elements that people haven't sort of considered or thought through. So it was, let's let's take a step back and, and you know, start at the beginning, some first principles, and hopefully that gives people grounds to, to build on. Okay, so you took me back to my uni days back in South Africa <laughs> with your one one. Um, and then on the 3rd of November, uh, we've got a session on ESG linked remuneration. So for the Victorians on the webinar, just after the Melbourne Cup weekend, uh, we, we look at how to ESG impact remunerations and potentially KPI of executives and management, etc. And in December, really interesting session, we'll have some corporate finance partners join us to talk to ESG due diligence and how it fits into um, IPO, etc. So that's our next a series of sustainability webinars. And for sure, there will be another series in 2023. So I've just said it, we're already talking 2023, fairly scary. Um, there's a link there to where we release all our webinars. So please free, feel free to check that out. So um, Brett, Decarbonisation 101, I'll hand over to you uh, to teach us all about the basics of decarbonisation. Thank you very much, Aletta, and uh, welcome everybody online. Um, I'm coming to you today from um, Mianjin, um, Brisbane, um, the home of the, the Turbal and Yagara people, um, First Nations groups here. So pay uh, my respects to the traditional custodians, um, their leaders past, present and emerging. Um, so I guess as, as I mentioned to, um, to a letter, the decarbonisation 101, the concept was, was to, I guess, go back to almost some first principles and and have a fairly basic um, journey through um, 
what does decarbonisation mean, where does it come from and why is it relevant for your business and then um, or organisation and Tim will um, then take us through some, um, some sort of foundational steps that you might need to consider um, as you embark on your de decarbonisation journey. So um, I thought it'd be worth starting with some, um, just have a bit of a history lesson and look at, at briefly some of the agreements um, over time that have been significant for one reason or another in getting us to where we are today. So, I mean, if we start back with the Montreal Protocol um, back in the late 1980s, it was clear that, um, you know, policy, uh, policy makers were thinking about atmospheric conditions and externalities of, of how we um, interact with the environment and interact with the atmosphere. I mean, this protocol was specifically related or, or targeting um, ozone depleting um, chemicals and, and what it did and I guess what it showed that was significant was that governments and policy makers around the world could come together and reach agreement on pretty significant steps in the way we conduct our business and the way we operate as a global economy. So that was, was significant in that sense in bringing policy makers together, um, getting global agreement. Um, think about Kyoto um, and the Kyoto Protocol. So it was first adopted in 1997 and then through a very complex ratification process it came into force in 2005. But this was the first step of trying to get um, global agreement and a committed um, uh, industrialised countries to limit and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in terms of the overall ambition at the time, it, it's probably not as significant as what we're seeing now. It sort of averaged out to around a 5% emission reduction um, compared to 1990 levels. Um, but what is significant, I guess, is again, it's that, that journey um, where uh, countries are coming to a place of global agreement about the need to act on um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we then came through um, through the Copenhagen Accord and into Paris. Um, I guess the, the 2010 or last decade was probably an interesting one in that it was characterised by a fairly significant agreement in Paris, the Paris Agreement. Um, but it also seemed to be characterised by um, governments being paralysed and, and you know, a lot of infighting and a lot of politicising of the need to do something around climate change. And, and over that period, I think um, it's probably fair to say that the broader stakeholders community and the business sector um, probably led um, uh, action on climate change through that period. Although the Paris Agreement clearly was significant because it, it for the first time started to set some goals in terms of where we wanted, what we wanted to achieve. Um, it was about limiting um, global warming um, to uh, two degrees above pre-industrial levels um, with an ambition to keep that preferably below one and a half degrees. Um, and then COP26 last year, um, so it sort of re-energised the global community, the global political community and it's got over 90% of the world's GDP and around 90% of the world's um, emissions now covered by net zero goals. So that's very significant um, and it's accelerated action on climate change um, mitigation actions by 2030 from another 153 countries. Now um, with the change of government in Australia we've, we've clearly seen um, an increase in ambition um, both near, in near term with the the 43% um, reduction target by 2030. And that's significant because it does um, put a lot of pressure on um, different sectors of the, uh, the economy, but particularly looking at the emissions intensity of um, uh, the, the electricity sector, for instance. So um, a couple of those um, references that, that I've just spoken through there, we've got some links um, for you to do some more research. Um, some, some interesting reading on each of those websites. So I commend you to, to sort of go and, and follow those links and have a bit of a look around. If it is a bit of a history lesson and you're wanting to understand that, that context of journey that, that's got us to this point. So um, I'll, I'll keep going on though. So I guess, you know, why, why are we, why is the globe or why are we demanding action? Why are we progressing? Um, action around reducing our CO2 and CO2 equivalent um, emissions. Um, since the end of the 19th century, we've broken out of, of this, I guess, cycle of 
um, atmospheric concentration of CO2 that had existed for a, you know, over a million years. And so there was this sort of nice neat cycle where we would, we would oscillate in a range between around 180 parts per million um, of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere to around 280 parts per million. And this had existed for, um, for the last million years or so, and we'd never exceeded 300 parts per million. Um, since um, uh, you know the, turn, the, the, the end of the 19th century, we've not only broken out of that, that range, but we're now sitting over 400 parts per million. Um, so there's been a significant jump out of what had been apparent, you know, what appears to be a fairly natural cycle of, of increasing concentration and then reducing concentrations. Now that's correlated with a period of increasing industrialisation and, and electrification of the global economy, which is largely driven by the consumption of fossil fuels. Um, you can see, you know, while that has driven great prosperity and in exponential increase in, in the standard of living, particularly in developed countries, it's not without its consequences. So you can see on the, on the chart on the left hand side, um, the blue line is the, the annual um, tonnes of CO2 emissions. And so, you know, it, it's been increasing gradually um, since the turn of or the start of the, the 20th century, but certainly picked up um, since the, the 40s and over that 1940s. And so over that time, the, the columns, which are measured on the right-hand axis, are the um, uh, annual temperatures or the variation from a, a 1900 to, to 2000 average. And you can see those temperatures are increasing um, as we continue to, to um, increase our emissions of CO2 per year. Um, over that, the last 50 to so on the right hand side, the maps from um, the Bureau of Meteorology website just shows um, it, it's quite small, so hard to pick up. But the the top um, the, the top chart of Australia uh, is looking at, at average annual rainfall um, uh, compared to long term averages, and it's showing that that east of Australia, east coast, and certainly east and inland is is getting particularly um, drier each year, despite what we've seen over the last um, two or three years on the East Coast with all the flooding. I guess that goes to the, the discussion around um, more variable and extreme weather events. Um, the chart on the bottom, the, the map of Australia on the bottom is showing um, um, annual median rainfall. Um, and there's a very similar chart for the, um, the annual max and the annual minimum. In each case, we're seeing the temperature progressively increase, the annual average is progressively increasing. And so what does that mean um, from a practical context? What, what are those sort of um, increasing temperatures and, and sort of more variable rainfall patterns mean? Um, you know, clearly there's physical consequences of these things where we're seeing um, warmer, warmer land, warmer sea, it, it, it changes the ability of um, our natural resources um, to provide biodiversity services, to provide ecosystem services, and as an input into our um, productive processes. We're certainly seeing more acidic um, oceans and less oxygenated oceans. And this has a, a feedback loop where things like, um, uh, you know, some of the, um, the glaciers in, in the Northern Hemisphere, as they melt, they're um, uh, exposing organic matter that's been locked away for, for thousands of years, the oxygen, uh, sorry, the decomposition of that organic material then um, releases um, more greenhouse gases. And so there's this feedback loop that we're seeing that as some of these consequences of a warming planet um, uh, are starting to build on themselves. And so this is where, you know, the IPCC and others um, talk about um, points of no return and, and threshold points. And um, we're also, clearly seeing um, reduction in, in biodiversity as the temperatures change and um, um, you know, plants and others that have evolved um, in a given climate, climatic condition are, are, are struggling. And we're seeing some of those more extreme weather events um, uh, across Australia and globally. And, and I guess what does that mean for us um, you know, in, in, a, in a practical sense, it's for organisations, um, you know, organisations that we work with, sorry, um, back one, um, in terms of the, the organisations we're working with, there are material risks um, in terms of access to resources that, that these companies need, but, you know, as raw inputs to, to production processes. Um, 
there's a change in markets or consumer preference for particular products and so how does a business um, respond to that? How do they um, stay relevant in the market? And clearly some of the physical impacts are impacting on infrastructure and impacting on um, workforces and, and the ability to work in extreme um, weather events. So there's some real, um, there's some very relevant issues that this poses not only as a physical consequence for our businesses, but some of those transitional issues um, as we consider um, uh, climate change going forward. So um, how do we how do we get to this point? And I'm, I've used this um, this economic principle known as the the tragedy of the commons, and and I think there's some parallels here. So the principle was first articulated. Um, in the context of, of grazing cattle or with reference to grazing cattle. And in that scenario, there was the commons and or this public field that was a shared resource. And no one, you know, there were no constraints on access to it. So a farmer um, accesses the commons for the purpose of grazing their cattle at, at no charge and they're not regulated. Um, initially, this isn't a problem because the carrying capacity of the fields greater than the number of cows that are grazing. Then other farmers cotton onto this and, and bring their cows into graze too, because you know, it's this free resource. Um, in this example, and, and with no regulation or, or charge for access to the commons, the farmer doesn't have any great incentive to reduce the stock numbers and let that field replenish it all. You know, he sort of thinks to him or herself, you know, if I reduce my stock numbers, it'll just be replaced by another cow. So, you know, why would I? Um, reduce my access to this this resource. And so it goes on until the commons has got to the point where, or past a tipping point where it can no longer um, carry the, the capacity or ca carry the number of um, cattle that are looking to graze. So there's plenty of parallels here with, with climate change where the, the, the atmosphere has in fact been considered that common resource where we've polluted with greenhouse gases up to the point where it's you know, where it's been largely unregulated um, and there's been no incentive for the polluters or polluting industries to stop. Um, and so we're now at that tipping point. Um, I guess what it does invite is, is sort of questions about, so who, who's responsible in the case of the, you know, the, the farming example, who, who's responsible for um, stopping that um, activity which does deplete the, the natural resource. And in, in some sense, I think it's probably all of us that are responsible for that because we've all enjoyed the fruits of that, that progress or that economic progress. So I think ultimately we're all responsible for it. Um, it also then invites the question of who's got to pay to address these, um, these challenges. Is it the owner of the cow or is it the consumer of the beef? Is it the coal miner or is it the consumer of the electricity? And these are the sort of questions that, you know, getting these rights are critical for the policy settings that incentivise the necessary action. But I think ultimately we all need to be able to shoulder the burden and um, that's across all sectors of the economy because we've enjoyed um, the, 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 um, the benefits that have come um, from access to that resource. So I think ultimately we will all share the burden of, of, of um, replenishing um, or, or stopping the pollution. Um, so what does the Australian emissions footprint look like? And, and you know, there's there's often a lot of conjecture about my sector doesn't pollute or your sector pollutes more and things like that. Um, here's you know essentially what it looks like. Um, the electricity sector is is the largest um, source of emissions by sector in Australia. Now. Um, the emissions intensity of the electricity network is reducing as you get greater penetration of um, renewable energy entering the, the electricity network. Um, so that percentage has come down from around 35% over the last couple of years down to 30, but it's still a significant source of um, emissions across Australia. Stationary energy talks to um, the consumption of fuels in, um, in in industrial manufacturing sort of settings. So that might be diesel or it might be gas that's used in, in industrial settings. Transport quite clearly, um, you know, planes, trains, automobiles. I think um, cars are responsible for just under half of all emissions under that transport sector. Trucks and buses around 20% and like commercial, um, just under 20% and the balance is made up for through rail and, and air freight and so on. Um, Across ag, um, 
the around three quarters of the greenhouse gas emissions are from um, a methane from um, enteric fermentation for ruminants, so um, beef, dairy, sheep, and so on. Um, and then there's other fertilisers and, and transport emissions there. Um, so what is it? Um, and then the fugitive emissions are essentially from um, uh, released as a result of um, extraction of um, uh, minerals, be it coal, be it gases and so forth to, to feed the electricity and, and stationary energy sectors. Um, so what does decarbonisation look like broadly across the across Australia in that sector? It's, um, there's a, there was a paper put out by Alan Finkel and it's a good read if you can get hold of it. Um, and he essentially says, um, yeah, electrify everything. So um, electrify a lot of your gas-based processes um, in, in industrial and manufacturing settings up to a point where um, you know, you'll probably get 90% of the way there, but things like cement and some of the really high heats that are required, um, you're probably not going to electrify economically uh, at the moment. But you take a big chunk of that stationary energy out. Um, by converting the electricity sector to renewables um, and you know, there's arguments about whether it should be 100% renewables or whether the, the, the least cost transition gets you to about 90% renewables, but notwithstanding, um, a large part of that electricity sector is, is um, coming from renewables. So by virtue of that, you take out a big chunk of the fugitive emissions as well, because you're not extracting um, coal and gas and so forth. Now, these things are going to happen over um, decades. It's not happening tomorrow. Um, transport is about, um, uh, you know, largely about e-mobility, so electric electrification of, of vehicles, um, and/or the use of hydrogen and other sort of fuel sources where more dense molecular structures are required for for freight and things like this. That you know, batteries aren't the appropriate source, and then something like um, uh, emissions from from agriculture, there's a lot of research going into um, reducing methane emissions from, from cows. And, and there's even something in the paper today talking about, you know, the burp and fart tax. And, and so, you know, there's different mechanisms, but there's a lot of work going on, you know, from a science point of view about how do we reduce the methane emissions from, from agriculture. But that's, that's going to be some hard work. Um, and then, then thinking a bit further, you know, getting into some of the, the concepts behind decarbonisation, you'll often hear about the different emission scopes, scope one, scope two, scope three. So Tim will talk a little bit, a bit more about that. Um, carbon neutral versus net zero, you know, are often used quite interchangeably, but I guess the way I tend to think about them is, is and I think of others may think about it um, this way as well, um, carbon neutral effectively implies you, um, you know, you're not necessarily looking if on this um, the inverted pyramid, you, you're not necessarily looking too hard at the avoid, reduce, and maybe even the replace, and you go largely to the offset place. So I continue operating as I am, but I'm going to find an awful lot of offsets. Um, net zero emission puts a lot more stock in the avoid. Um, avoid emissions in the first place, reduce my consumption um, and therefore reduce my emissions or replacing my fuel source um, with, with renewables before then um, using carbon offsets as a, as a sort of a top up at the end. Um, so they're just a couple of the concepts you might hear as you go forward. Um, thinking then about decarbonisation and, and um, what does it mean? So um, you might hear um, discussion around a carbon budget um, and, and how does this all work. So I guess um, naturally there is this interplay between um, natural emissions um, from uh, sort of fugitive emissions from land use change from um, uh, decomposition of, of organic matter and so forth and natural sinks so you know vegetation the uptake of um, co2 through photosynthesis organic matter being captured in soils and and you know the ocean um, absorbing um, levels of um, co2 as well so naturally there's this sort of um, these this uh, sources and sinks and and you know for millennia that's been kept in balance until we've come along um, so there's an underlying concept that um, there's an estimated threshold of CO2 that the world can emit um, or accumulate in the atmosphere while still having a likely chance of limiting global temperature rises to, to one and a half degrees um, above pre-industrial levels. Um, 
And so the estimation of that carbon budget at any point in time and the trajectories to, to stay within that budget, consider all the necessarily, or, you know, all the emissions that are, that are forecast and all the possible sources of, of remo removal um, of, of CO2, which are the direct activities or the indirect activities of, of humans. Um, and so there is a pathway that you will, you know, the, the net zero by 2050, um, I guess, is, is the pathway that um, is probably the most likely to keep us on track to the, the one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. And it's sort of doesn't, well, there's a, there's a bit of a, um, a development of technology and policy to get us there. But in theory, you could push out that, that budget further um, and not go on a net zero path, but you need to have an awful lot of faith that you're going to have negative emissions over time to draw that additional carbon out. So it's a bit like your, you know, your household um, budget at the end of the fortnight, my pay, the next pay hasn't gone in, I'm tapping that credit card pretty hard. Um, I've now got to top the credit card up. Now globally and, and in an atmospheric sense and global warming sense, we're doing the same thing. At the moment, we're tapping the credit card um, more and more at the supermarket. Um, at some point in time, we need to find those negative emissions to be able to draw those out of the atmosphere. Um, so I guess that, that sort of, um, some of that background context provides a, you know, a bit of a lens on what the business imperative is. Um, so increasingly, we're going to see legislative requirements for businesses to, to act. So the climate change bill um, with um, legislating emissions reduction targets um, and an expansion or revision of the safeguard mechanism will have implications for large um, emitters. And who knows what the revision look like and looks like and how far into the economy that goes in terms of um, businesses that are, that are subject to it. Um, I think that the disclosure requirements in the market demands is a really interesting one in that um, stakeholders are increasingly wanting transparency around what businesses and organisations are doing um, around climate change and what the climate related risks are. Disclosure requirements at the moment are voluntary, notwithstanding you know, requirements under the um, uh, engines reporting for, for businesses captured there, but, but broadly investors um, uh, and, and key stakeholders are asking of businesses, what are you doing about climate change? How exposed are you to risk, material risks of climate change? Uh, increasingly, those disclosure requirements are going to become mandatory. Um, the International Financial Reporting Standards Body um, over in Europe um, is, has released disclosure standards about some mon uh, mandatory um, disclosure requirements. Um, a betting man would suggest, or betting woman would suggest that um, they will trickle down to Australia um, and, and other jurisdictions that our you know, businesses and our organisations interact with. And so um, that mandatory requirement we think will come in over the next couple of years. Um, and then the market demands, it's about you know, consumers, it's about investors um, asking, as I said, you know, what's a business or what's an organisation doing um, to mitigate their exposure to climate change. And a big part of that is what are you doing to decarbonise your operations? Um, and I think that's not just sort of commercial operations, that also goes to not-for-profits and, and other NGOs that you know, are seeking grants, are seeking um, philanthropic funding. Um, because those the providers of that capital are asking similar questions. So what the business outcomes are, you know, fundamentally about retaining access to capital or investments, um, retaining access to markets as consumer preferences shift from um, high emissions intensity products to low emissions intensity products, and it's about retaining access to people. So you know, as we're interviewing um, potential new starters with BDO. Often I'm getting interviewed about you know what's what's BDO's position on certain things, and that's a broader ESG conversation often, but certainly a lot of it comes back to what are we doing about decarbonisation. So there's some some basic things to to sort of consider about a bit of a historical context or background context. Thanks, Aletta. Thanks, Thank you very much. I just have to say, I don't know what's happened to my slides. It's disappeared. I haven't touched anything, but I think it's back. Um, just on the wrong spot. So let me just find the right spot um, for us. Uh, 
Brett, I think we had a few polling questions that we thought we could run now before we hand over to Tim, if that's all right with you. So maybe we'll do the first one where we're asking our participants to share their views. So first of all, is um, decarbonisation um, on your strategic agenda? Um, so we're hoping it is. Um, but it would be interesting to know, you know, is there something um, that you've put on that strategic agenda? Yes, no, I'm sure, or thinking about it. Um, please participate. I think it's interesting for us, but also interesting for your fellow attendees to get an idea how they placed, um, you know, in comparison with their peers. So we'll just give it a, a minute or so for everybody to share their views. And thank you for those who are participating in our survey. Fantastic. So we've got about 50% of all attendees have, have voted. I'll give you, uh, let's say, another five counts to vote. Fastest fingers first, five, four, three, two, one, and I'll close that and then I'll share. Um, uh, so interestingly, um, Brett, Tim, I don't know if you've got any particular comments. Um, so it's a large percentage of our attendees have actually said 66% um, that decarbonisation is on their strategic agenda, which is great. A number of people know and, and, and a number of people not sure. It's definitely encouraging to see such a high number. Absolutely, absolutely. And then maybe the next one before I hand over to Tim. Uh, Tim, you sip some water, get ready. So the question <laughs> is, is your organisation um, working on decarbonising your business? So it might be in your strategy, but have you actually started on that decarbonisation process? So I think we're going a little bit deeper now. So that would be, again, interesting. I mean, please share your thoughts. Uh, we would love to know. You yes. know, so our option, so our option yeah. on now, uh, or we've measured our benchmark, which is fantastic. We need a benchmark because ESG and sustainability, um, it's, it's all continuous improvement. And so if you at least have a benchmark, that's great. Or we've set a decarbonisation target or a strategy. Again, you've got a plan in place to get there. Or we're well underway to our decarbonisation goals. So not only do you have a benchmark, you have a target, you've started moving towards that target. So all the different levels. Um, and there's no right or wrong at this stage. It's, um, it's a continuous improvement game. Sorry, Tim, I think I've cut you off. No, I was in the middle of... Uh, when you're in the middle of it, I was about to say this will pair well with the last one um, to see, you know, some people may have started, but how far into it they've actually gotten. Because um, we see a lot of people at the very, very beginning of it with discussions around, you know, decarbonisation and where they're going to go, but uh, kind of at a loose end, I guess, of, you know, how they get there and how they implement it along the way. Absolutely. No, absolutely. So to look at the two uh, questions in combination, I think would be interesting. So remember the previous one, 66% of attendees said is on the strategic agenda. Um, so again, 50% of attendees have already voted. Fastest fingers first. So it's five, four, three, two, one. Thank you very much, everybody that's participated. I'll close it and I'll share it. And uh, Tim, I suppose, as you suspected, um, you know, 66% said, you know, we've got it on our agenda. Um, and have we started working on it? Um, you know, 49% said no, right? So that's a, quite a big difference. Yeah, and, and realistically, kind of what we're expecting to see, um, hence why we're in the, you know, decarbonisation 101 and not 102. Um, <laughs> still at those early days of um, people are interested, people want to get involved, but, you know, it's that education, the understanding and, you know, where to from there that we're kind of uh, getting stuck at. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
All right, so I'll stop that. And uh, Tim, I think we over to you to talk about the decolonization process. And um, Brett, thank you very much. That was really interesting. I love that. Cheers, Brett. Yeah, so um, we've kind of already gone through the the why of it. You know, so why do we need to decarbonize? What's it's, the impact's going to be? Um, and now it's kind of the how. Um, and so we we put it as a three phase process um, of measuring emissions, finding out your options, and implementing. So you know, your first phase is going to be quantifying your and mapping those greenhouse gas emissions. Um, going through, you know, looking at your activities um, and seeing which one's material. And as Brett talked about previously with scope one, two, and three, um, you'd wanna be looking at initially, at, at the very least, your scope one emissions, which are your direct emissions or those that you have operational control over, which I'll go over in a bit more detail later. Um, and then as you mature and you, know, you get a greater understanding, you kind of expand out and go to your indirect emissions, which are your scope two and scope three. Um, and then, Following on from that, you're going to be looking at reviewing your options. So finding out what's actually available, what's commercially viable, um, what's realistic to implement, um, deciding on that pro approach, uh, and then designing a plan to implement. And then lastly, obviously with all of these things, you need to actually implement what you've decided on. Um, and then long-term, you need to be measuring you know, effectiveness around it, uh, adapting and improving over time, and realistically uh, embedding some kind of uh, related KPIs, just so you can um, have a long-term strategy around it. Um, and we don't want to kind of, you know, flash in the pan situation of a bunch of effort and time and effort goes into getting something in place, um, which then leads to a year's worth of work and then nothing further from that. So loosely, that's the, um, the three-phased approach of measuring emissions, getting your options, implementing, and then starting again. But uh, we'll go through that, that first phase now in a little more detail. So mapping scope one emissions. So you'll hear uh, scope one emissions, direct emissions, meaning the same thing. And essentially they're activities that create emissions that you have um, operational control over. So being in Australia, we always take uh, mining as an example. Um, if you know I'm running a mine site and there's a truck driving around site using diesel, creates emissions, um, I can go down to the truck driver and tell them to operate under different health and safety protocols, different environmental policies, when to stop and start. So realistically, I have direct control over the activity, I have control over those emissions. Um, and in Australia, uh, we quantify those emissions with the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Determination. You'll often hear it called the ENGA determination. And that basically just outlines all the methodology around how to measure those emissions. Um, and so, you know, this is from anything from power generation, mining, transport, oil and gas. So as a recommendation, we'd say for establishing at least an initial baseline, you'd want to at least be doing your scope one emissions. Um, and that's your, uh, theoretically, your maximum amount of emissions, your you know number you want to look back to over time, and then year on year, you want to be reducing down from that number. Um, and then if we go following slide, the, the more mature you are as a company, the more comfortable you are with your emission strategy and your know, ability to um, calculate and estimate them, you would expand then into scope two and scope three. Um, now scope two does come under the angle determination as well, but we kind of um, link it up with scope three because they're both called uh, what are called indirect emissions. So they're ones that uh, are emissions that occur um, outside of your operational control, but as a result of your operations. So scope two is just essentially purchased energy and you'll often hear of it just as uh, purchased electricity. So, you know, when you're linked into the grid and getting the electricity, that electricity had to be generated somewhere and that generation generally has um, some emissions associated with it. And then the kind of black box of emissions reporting right now is uh, scope three emissions. So sadly, there isn't a um, requirement to report on these emissions in Australia. Um, and there isn't, as a result, much of a methodology behind it. Um, and it, it, that can make it quite difficult to really understand the impact of your business um, and in industries in general. 
Um, and this does have some issues where, where some in, uh, for some industries, um, the actual emissions footprint is quite low for their direct emissions and quite high for their indirect emissions. Um, but all of this uh, is, is part of your understanding of your baseline and part of that first phase, which is really mapping and understanding your emissions because you can't decarbonize what you don't understand um, and you can't understand what you don't measure. So a big, big part is just going through your footprint um, and mapping all of your emissions so that you've got a good baseline to work from when you move into phase two. And then, yeah, so one, once you've mapped your emissions for your business, um, you want to be identifying where you can have the greatest impact. Um, so this is where you have the you know, most material emissions. And again, taking that mine site example, um, across a mine site, you're going to have multiple emission sources, but generally you'll have a mining fleet, quite large, maybe a power station as well. And then you have minor things like um, oils, greases, you know, uh, gases around the site. And while it would be great to, you know, go through the whole thing and take out all emission sources um, from, you know, a conservation of energy standpoint, there's not much point going in and getting rid of minor sources on site. Um, we would want to be looking at the, the biggest impact in the, quick, the quickest way we can. Um, so once you've identified those large sources of emissions, then you're moving into research. So you're looking for new technologies or changes in operations that preferably first will avoid emissions occurring or um, reduce them. Now, uh, again, with that mine site example, if we had power generation on site through diesel generators, um, avoiding emissions, that would be something like switching to solar, uh, which we see a lot of across our mine sites right now, um, or reduction in emissions, which was, you know, you, you could switch to um, a lower emissions fuel like pipeline natural gas or uh, biofuels. But all of this needs to be balanced with the, the fact that while I, you know, individually, I'd personally like emissions to be reduced tomorrow, um, that's not commercially viable, uh, and you need to have an understanding of what what's possibility, uh, what's possible, and what's realistic. Um, so, you know, in, in mining right now, um, you you see, sorry, go back one more letter. Um, you'll see uh, a lot of people are talking about solar change to power requirements, wind, um, hydropower, even, and the reason why they come up a lot often is because they're commercially viable. Those are things that right now we can actually implement at scale. Um, or we can, you know, hook people into the grid, we can change and then change the grid to renewable electricity. Uh, what we're talking there about with, you know, things that aren't commercially viable, this good example is, you know, mining fleets right now. We were talking to a, um, a mining contractor. They said to us, there's 10 underground electric boggers in the world. We have contracts for eight of them. There's nothing else for anyone. And that's where, you, you know, it'd be great if we could make those switches quickly, but you need to understand what is realistic, what is possible. Um, so once you've gone through and, you know, you've identified where you want to reduce your emissions, where you can implement and focus on, you now need to figure out your implementation plan. So part of this is defining responsibility for that implementation. Um, it needs to be, you know, some uh, the responsibility of someone within the business to be able to drive it long term, um, and yeah, develop that long term strategy. Um, because, like I said before, a, a one off uh, drop in emissions for a year um, isn't going to make too much of a difference. And realistically, large scale emission reductions are a, a long term thing. They require capital. They require um, huge uh, infrastructure changes, um, and as well as that, we need to be, you know, embedding and measuring those changes. So um, putting in KPIs, putting in uh, year on year um, checks to see how much of an impact it's actually had. Um, and then lastly, you know, with anything like this, you need to review and revisit. So just because something wasn't commercially viable today doesn't mean in two years time it won't be. Um, and again, those examples around electrified vehicles is, is really good because we see how quickly um, they're, they're coming through right now. Um, and that's realistically going to be the, the big, big turning point is being able to 
um, improve and adapt these plans over time and not having a, a fixed thought process where just because we've decided on, you know, electrifying the, um, uh, renew putting renewables into our electricity doesn't mean that tomorrow there might not be another option or a better option or something that can um, complement it. And yeah, that's basically once you've gone through that whole process, it's then just reviewing and improving over time and starting again. Um, and I think the next one should just show just a few examples. Um, some of these you may have heard about, some may not have, um, but I, I few of them that I quite liked. Uh, the first one kind of covers off on uh, decarbonisation of an industry. So um, steel production is a very emissions intensive industry, um, basically just because it requires coal right now. Um, and anything that you need coal in is going to have a lot of emissions associated with it. So there's been this pivot into researching how hydrogen could be used instead of coal. Um, but again, while it's theoretically possible, they've you know made small amounts, you still run into that issue of scale and uh, commercial viability, where the infrastructure that would need to be changed to you know be able to pipe hydrogen in large quantities, to be able to generate hydrogen in large quantities, these are all issues that need to be solved. So that's where you see kind of uh, an industry trying to figure out how to decarbonize itself. And then secondly, we've got um, South Australian electricity grid transition. So again, looking at that, you know, those long-term strategies, those improvements year and year, they uh, decided they wanted to decarbonize their grid. And it, it's basically been a 15 year um, strategy where they've gone from, you know, 1% renewables to 60% over time through a combination of solar, wind and battery storage. Um, and the thing, the, things like this at scale have a, a really big positive effect in that, you know, the amount of uh, industry people that use that grid means that those um, benefits flow on to everyone what flows onto industry uh, in their scope to emissions. Um, and then lastly, uh, on the supply chain side of things or scope three emissions, uh, we had Ikea. So they went through, they did their baseline and what they noticed was that realistically their scope one and scope two emissions were actually quite small and where a lot of the, the large amount, 90% was in their scope three emissions. And so they've switched their focus over, um, over into reducing their scope three emissions. Um, obviously they still have tried to reduce their direct emissions through renewable energies and things like that. But it, it shows where, you know, that you need to um, have a very good understanding of your entire footprint to really get the, the most benefit out of it. Um, but yeah, th those are just three examples. There's many, many more um, and hopefully we'll even more, more to come. And I think the, the last poll we, we had here, um, I think the letter was just around the decarbonisation date or when we think we should be getting to that, you know, net zero. Absolutely. So, you know, when would you like to see your business reach that net zero? Um, I know there's a lot of talk, um, not after 2050. So you can see the very last option we've got is 2050. But some organisations have decided on a more aggressive approach, maybe 2025 or 2030 or 2040, um, you know. So please, again, we would love to see what our attendees uh, think and what their approach are. Um, that would be very interesting. At the moment, around 40% of people have voted. So it would be great if more people could share their views. That would be amazing. And Tim, thank you very much for that. I loved your examples. Thank it's you. amazing how an it's amazing how an example um, brings things to uh, you know to life. So thank you very much for for that. So oh, we've got around fifty percent. So I'll give it a little bit more time. You know, Alita, uh, while while we're waiting for for people to respond, I think um, one of the things that I found particularly interesting from Tim's discussion was around the implementation, that phase three, because often um, we find that businesses or organisations don't adequately think through the, the all of the detail and all of the resources and all the effort that's required into that stage. And it's simple yeah. things like, you know, I think, you know, preempting your next 
webinar thinking about how do you link um, something like decarbonisation, both activities and achievement of a goal to remuneration, for instance. What sort of requirements are there for this to filter through to all your governance suite? So you might need to, to rethink your whole procurement policy um, such that when you're going to market for particular products, um, consideration of the carbon footprint or the emissions intensity of a particular product is one of the considerations in your buying decisions. So, so you know, I think it's absolutely right that there's this approach to, to identifying your decarbonisation activities and going and implementing those. But to do it really well, the organisations that we see it do it really well, um, it, it sort of permeates all aspects of the organisation. Um, so, you know, a little, I thought um, that's, that's sort of relevant for some of the, the businesses on today. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Brett. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's why we've, we've got that webinar. It would be really interesting to see how we make all of this real for organisations. So we know it's only real when it somehow hits your pocket, right? So impacts remuneration. That's the fastest way to make it real for any executive. Um, so if you look here, when would you like to reach that net zero? 53% uh, of, oh, sorry, I should share it. I'm a bit slow here. 53% uh, set by 2030, um, which is amazing. At 21%, 2040, 10%, 2050. And then not to forget that 16% already want to reach net zero by 2025, which is quite impressive. So that's very interesting, actually. Um, so thank you very much again for participating. Um, in the bowl, that is sensational. Yeah, um, it'd be interesting to see something like that in a few years' time to see if there is the, the you know, that increased uh, appetite for net zero earlier and earlier. Absolutely. Um, and then finally, if you need any assistance or if you want to have a conversation, maybe you're not at the assistance stage yet, but you need a, want to have a conversation with any of our sustainability team members, but in particular, if you want to speak to Brett or Tim about what they've just discussed to date around decarbonisation, um, we've included their contact details on slide two. Uh, so you're welcome to reach out to any of us also. If you want to stay up to date with all the latest developments, um, we issue a monthly corporate reporting insights uh, newsletter. And in there, um, you know, all the IFRA stuff and etc. But there's also uh, the key section these days is around sustainability. So if you want to stay up to date, you can either go to the website to access all of that, or you could uh, register um, for our corporate reporting insights. And then there's a link to where you register. Obviously, you can also link with us on LinkedIn. I think that's the best way these days to re receive very timely up-to-date information. But please register for our newsletter. Um, on our website, we also have um, a lot of information available around sustainability reporting, a number of articles, um, resources from BDO Global. We've got all our recorded webinars around ESG, which will now be seven. And we also have online um, training resources, and that was around the TCFD reporting. And so there's an online course that you can do for free to get up to speed with TCFD disclosures that are now also embedded in the S2 standard by the International Sustainability Standards Board. And then on our BDO uh, website, we've got a dedicated area for all things sustainability, whether it's our learning hub, um, our contacts, our services, etc. The other really amazing thing uh, that I'm super excited about um, is that we've um, been working on um, preparing BDO Australia's inaugural sustainability report, uh, which will be issued on the 31st of October. Um, so very soon, and we're just finalising the design aspects at the moment. So Ashley and I, over the six months, did not only talk about preparing your first sustainability report, we've actually physically done that for BDO Australia. 
Um, so I do understand the pain involved in gathering the data, making sure we've got the systems, the processes, spreading the message across an organisation of more than 2,000 people, etc. Um, so look out for our sustainability report. Uh, Brett and Tim ha have also contributed to that and have seen that. So we're really proud of our sustainability journey. And that's our inaugural report. Um, you can, as I've said earlier, you can look at our online training um, just to understand what TCFDs are. And it's basically linking sustainability and in particular climate risk with the audited financial statement. So how do you create that link between the two? Um, and then obviously, if you want to contact any of us, our email addresses or our numbers. And, and this is the broader team. Um, so Sharif, um, which, the, which is the co-leader, is based in Perth, Brett is in Brisbane, Tim is in Perth, Ashley is in Melbourne with me, Catherine in Perth, Dylan and Cherie both in Brisbane, Josh uh, in Adelaide, Justin Harness, a new partner, joined BDO six weeks ago, looking after Sydney, Ian Hooper in Sydney and Phil Murdoch in Sydney. Um, so any discussions around ESG or sustainability, please feel free to reach out to any of the team. Um, finally, to Brett and to Tim, thank you very much for joining the webinar presenting. It was very interesting, loved um, hearing uh, you speak, and I'm hoping you'll join us very soon again. And uh, to everybody who has attended, thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Cheers, Leila. Thanks. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Tim. Bye. Bye.